Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 142 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. So happy that you're with me today. Today, I'm talking to Lamar Giles, and he has got some fantastic tips for you. Uh, one of his, the dialogue trick, I absolutely love. You're going to love this conversation with him. It was super fun and super educating to me. I learned a lot, so I hope you do too. In a personal update, um, I, you know how I am on this show. I tell y'all the truth. And I realized two days ago that I have been in a low grade depression, which is surprising to me. It is always surprising to me when I go into depression that is um, chemical, hormonally related, all of that, because I don't have typical depression. I mean, who does? All depressions are different. Um, but mine typically don't have the sadness. Um, I can be a little bit quicker to tears when something is moving or sad, but that's I think that's kind of a human response. So I don't walk around feeling sad. I don't walk around feeling blue, uh, <laughs> which is why it's confused me so much in the past and which is why I'm bringing it up. Um, because lately I have just been lying around doing nothing, doing a lot of nothing which is very unlike me. I have been reading a lot, which is great, which is absolutely wonderful. And I've been giving myself permission to lie in bed a lot, reading a lot. Over the Labor Day weekend, it really became clear to me. I spent basically those three days, almost the full time, unless we were going out to do something, almost the full time in bed with books. And again, I'm reading. That's fantastic. I'm not spending all my time on real housewives of something or another because I could do that. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I, what I do when I enter this kind of depression is I spend a lot of time staring up at the ceiling and thinking to myself, I'm not depressed. I'm not depressed. I'm not depressed. I think I have to remember that when I start to tell myself that I'm not depressed and when I start to tell my wife that I'm not depressed, that I just really like relaxing and reading in bed, which I do, uh, that I'm that I'm lying in some way or that I should be looking deeper. And of course, every time I say I'm not depressed, I do look deeper and I didn't quite see it until two days ago when it just struck me, this is not normal. My inability to do things. I'm getting all my work stuff done, I'm getting absolutely everything done that needs to get done, and I'm having a good time with the things I do. Again, not typical for depression. I have a ton of fun with my teaching. I've been having a great time with everything that I'm writing, but when I'm not actually in the process of doing something that I am committed to, I am laying in the bed, looking out the window or reading a book. So I say this just to be honest with you guys. This is um, normal. It's part of a normal life is depression. It comes and goes. I am on antidepressants. They changed my life after I had a hysterectomy at 39 because uh, hormones, especially for women, for all people, but especially for women, are really part of the whole emotional stability in the in the mix so I am getting my medications uh, my medication I'm just on one adjusted and that'll be good and I'm taking care of myself and it was almost a relief to realize that I was depressed instead of just lazy which of course I was telling myself I was I was beating myself for, up for that and feeling even worse so there's a level of relief I really like being transparent with y'all about this and there is also a certain book blues that lands on you after a book comes out after you spent so much time working on it and it's out there in the world and you can't do anything more about it and it's off your plate uh, this is not that i actually i actually don't feel like i have the book blues this time i'm just so glad it's out there so i'm glad to recognize it for what it is i am glad that you guys listen with an open heart and hey if you don't have an open heart and you think i'm weak I don't care. I am just happy that you might stick around for some awesome writing advice from Lamar. That's also good. But if you do relate, if you have gone through this, you can always drop me a line about anything that happens on the show or whatever uh, at rachelherron.com. So 
that's easy. Um, what else is going on? I started 90 Days to Done, the new masterclass session, which is now closed. You can't get into it. And no, I never did announce it on the podcast. I just announced it in my Slack channels. And that class goes like that. As soon as it's open, it's closed. I take 12 people. We work our way through writing a first draft in three months. Last time I was going to do it with them, but I had some publication stuff that I had to do some revisions, so I wasn't able to. This time, I'm really hoping that I also get to write a novel in 90 days. It is the most fun class I teach. It even beats out my memoir class now. I have to say, I love this 90 days to done and we just started today and everybody who's in the class is awesome and it's going to be so fun and if you're sitting there uh, wondering how you can get into the next session you can go to rachelherron.com slash 90 days to done that's nine zero days to done and there's a sign up here to be notified of the next class and i'll notify you first even before the slack people but yes, it is closed. It's just so exciting, the 12 of us, and most of them haven't written a book before, and most of them will finish if it goes like last class. So very excited about that. And just quickly, new patrons to thank. Thank you, Anya Carolina Christensen, and thank you, Tracy Devlin. It's so wonderful to have you aboard. If you'd like to look at Patreon, that's patreon.com slash Rachel, R-A-C-H-A-E-L. And y'all, I'm tired. I've got a bunch of stuff still to do this afternoon and I got to pay some bills. So then I'm going to maybe lie on the couch and look at the ceiling in a way that nourishes my soul. It's usually petting a dog or a cat at the same time. So if you're fighting any blues, if you're dealing with depression, any mental illness at all, know that you're not alone. There's lots of us out there struggling sometimes feeling good other times um i accept what i've got on my plate and i hope that listening to this might help you just a tiny bit have a brighter day on your side that would make me very very happy okay i wish you happy writing all drop me a line with what you're doing and i look forward to talking to you and enjoy this awesome interview with lamar well i could not be more pleased today to welcome to the show lamar giles hello lamar Hello, hello. How are you? I'm thrilled to have you on the show. Let me give you a quick introduction. Uh, Lamar Giles writes novels and short stories for teens and adults. He is the author of the Edgar Award nominees Fake ID and Endangered, as well as the novels Overturned, Spin, The Last Last Day of Summer, and the forthcoming Not So Pure and Simple. He is a founding member of We Need Diverse Books and resides in Virginia with his wife. Um, I, I, when I, I didn't know this about you until I got your bio, but we need diverse books. That's amazing that you are a founder of that. Oh yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's, um, it's amazing that it's been going strong for five years now. Yes. It, um, it's, you know, it's something that started just from a place of love with me and several other authors. And it, it blew up into this thing that seems to have been helping the industry and continues to help the industry. So I'm happy to have been a part of that. It helps the industry and I see it getting bigger every year. So it's, I'm, I'm very, I'm honored to have you on the show, but this show is about writing process. And, um, as my listeners know, it's because I'm always looking for a better process because my process is always evolving. I would love to hear about you and your process. How do you go about getting all of these books done? What does that look like for you? Sure. Oh, I'm going to give you two versions. Oh, good. I'll give you the version that's probably most relevant to people who are trying to break into the business okay. and maybe have to juggle other things. Yes. And then I'll tell you the current version. Ooh. So the first version is the version that I went through for about a decade. And that's when I had a day job. I worked for um, a corporation doing mm -hmm. boring spreadsheet level things, you know, and I still wanted to write. So I had to be at work from like eight in the morning to sometimes six in the evening. And when I get off work, I'd be exhausted. So it was like the mm. worst energy of the day. And so for 10 years, I just made myself get up every morning at five and I would write from like 5.30 to seven. And then I'd get in the shower, get ready to go to my cubicle job. I'd be exhausted by like four o'clock and I had to push through two hours of work that I didn't necessarily want to do, but I felt okay about it because I'd already done the work that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so that was the case for 10 years before I sold a novel. And so I, I tell that part just because I think that's probably most relevant to people who have to juggle a bunch of different things and they're trying to figure out how to make time. And I mean, 
you know, we've all got the same 24 hours. And so, I, and I, I'm not saying everybody should do what I did. Um, some people do better working late. Mm-hmm. Some people do better squeezing in on their lunch hour. But you do have to make that time, I think, on a daily basis. Now that writing is my job, I don't have to get up as early, but the process is um, similar in the sense that I'm up every morning treating it like a job. Mm -hmm. But now it's more like I might start at like eight and work till noon, take a lunch break. I still treat it the same way I treat it, my day job. Whereas I work in the morning, take a break, work in the afternoon. And I try to knock off if nothing's pressing by like five or so, so I can eat dinner with my wife and enjoy some, you know, time watching TV or something in the evenings. And so that's essentially my process. I treat it like a day job now. That is exactly what I do. And I was exactly like you. I spent the 10 years doing both, getting up real early before work. And then, but the day I was able to quit, how did that feel for you when you were able to become a full-time writer? Well, it's interesting because I didn't actually quit. I was laid off twice. Oh, wow. And um, the first time I was laid off, I just sold my first novel, Fake Uh ID. Uh And so it wasn't horrible because I'd been at the job for about a decade. So I had a severance package. Mm -hmm. I had the the book money. It wasn't a big advance, but it was there. Yeah. And so for, but I still didn't feel comfortable enough to say I'm a full-time writer. So I was still looking for work. I was out of work for about six months and then I got another tech job. And so I was a novelist and doing tech work for about two more years. Now, what happened on the second layoff was super interesting because I went into this job not really – I've learned from my previous job it was best not to let people at the office know I had a creative endeavor. Um, they didn't always react well. I, I literally had a guy try to get me fired once. Are you serious? Was, yeah. He thought I was writing on company time or using company resources, which was not the case. Oh um, that's a long story. I'm not, But it, it taught me a lesson that it's best to keep that hidden mm-hmm. from people who won't understand. And so I tried to do that at my new job, but I'd also had my second novel come out. I was doing TV interviews. You're and Googleable. Like I, yeah, 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 yeah. And literally, I'd be doing a signing at my local Barnes and Noble, and one of my coworkers would walk in. You know, <laughs> that's pretty rad, though. <laughs> so, so like, so everything was fine until one day my boss pulls me aside, and she, and it's weird because we don't really she doesn't pull me aside for stuff, and she's like, so Lamar, I was just wondering, um, how's that writing thing going? And so I knew something was off. And I say, you know, what's the deal? And she's like, look, it's come from up high that I got to let someone on the team go. If you need this job, it won't be you because I I did my work. I was good at my job. She was like, but you're really the only person who has anything else going on outside of here. Wow. And she's like, I'm just asking you, like, do you plan to stay or was this a thing that you're thinking about doing full time? Because if so would you consider taking the hit? I mean, she basically asked, and it was one of those things where I didn't like the job at all. Mm. People were fine. The people were fine. My boss was lovely. My coworkers were fine, but I did not like the work. And I was sort of getting tired of the corporate hamster wheel. Mm -hmm. And so I said, do it. I mean, I was super scared. It's not like I had like a ton of money in the bank. Yeah. But I'm like, if not now, when? And it just so happened to work out. I mean, it's five years later. I haven't been in a cubicle since. So, it's pretty great, right? It's yeah, been it's yeah. been it's been four years for me, and I yeah. still I I, I, just, I was just doing bills, and I'm like stressing myself out all over again. But like every day that I'm able to be in my office and do this job and not be in that rat race, it makes me feel so happy. You I know? always say my worst writing day is better yes. than my best cubicle day. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love that. I hope that people are listening and getting expired <laughs> and knowing that we, you know, you just got to put the time in and it takes, it takes a while. So what is your biggest challenge then when it comes to writing nowadays? Hmm. The struggle to not repeat myself. Yeah. Because I found like sometimes you'll get an idea and you'll think like, man, it's super original. And then I'll think, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I go and look back at something I wrote, like I already did that. And so it's like, it's like this struggle to not go to the same well all the time and the way I've sort of been switching it up is to try different genres Mm. which that's also scary because I think I'm pretty good at writing a mystery or a thriller and so now that I'm writing like middle grade fantasy um I may do some young adult fantasy I'm I may I'm got the contemporary coming of age story coming out Uh, I'm feeling what I guess I guess the proper word is doubt (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to use my, my, my dictionary and my vocabulary and say that I guess doubt is the biggest challenge. 
Yeah. Would you agree, though, that we always go back to a similar well in terms of core story? Because I do. I also dabble in genres, but I always go back to that core story of chosen family and hope and um, no matter what. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think you do tend to go back to similar themes. I tend to write about identity a lot. Mm. Um, who who are you really, and particularly in crisis? Um, mm. So I, I think there's something to that. Mm, that's so interesting. Okay, so what is your biggest joy then? I mean, I get to make up stuff for a living. I mean, like, and it's like, it's it's a fun job, and it's I'm not struggling anymore. It's like I, I've reached a point in my career where things are okay. It's not like I'm rich, mm-hmm. but it's like I'm doing as well or better as I did when I was a corporate guy That's but it's doing work that i actually want to do and like i mean i i don't i don't take it lightly that everybody doesn't get that opportunity i have it, so I, yeah i have this pair of socks that somebody gave me and, it, and they say not gonna lie i just make shit up <laughs> <laughs> and that is my job <laughs> yeah I, I, it, it 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 amazes me if sometimes i get together with some writer friends when we're at conferences and stuff and like we talk about it like we're getting paid to make things up <laughs> And it's just, you know, like I said, particularly the way people stress about money, I can't take it lightly that I get to do this and I'm doing okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Can you share a quick craft tip of any sort? Sure. Um, I think about voice a lot. Mm. Voice is a big thing for me. And one thing that I've done in recent years is try to read dialogue without dialogue tags. Like when I'm revising, like even though it's on the page, I just read the dialogue as is. And I feel like any line of dialogue should be attributable (laughs) to a character without you knowing the dialogue tag. So like, for instance, in my last book, Spin, my last thriller, um, the three main characters are Fuse, Kaya, and Paris. I would really look at their dialogue and say, I know that's what Paris would say and how she would say it. And I know that line is Fuse's. And that's the exact way she would phrase it. And if something didn't feel right, I'd adjust. Um, so I always think it's a good idea to be able to read your dialogue and know who it belongs to without the tag. And if you can't do that, maybe consider revising the line. Going deeper into that, which I think is brilliant, um, how do you make the voices separate? This is something that I personally struggle with. Mm-hmm. Um, is it something that for- comes naturally or do you actually architect? Are you an architect of it? I don't think it's necessarily natural. I think it comes from practice, and I think it has a lot to do with just, like, trying stuff. I revise a lot. I always say writing is rewriting. And so I think, honestly, first, second draft, it may not always be there. But just constantly refining and trying to just think of that character's personality. Um, I know that Kaya is reserved. Mm. I know that she she has talents that she doesn't like people to know about what does that look like when she's referring to this topic and like it just takes a lot of trial and error um i'm the camera won't pan over there but i have a shelf of like draft manuscripts it's just like you know i print my manuscripts out i go through them it's like there'll be like four or five of those things for one book yeah 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 i love this because i'm always talking to my students about draft passes And, you know, I I always have to do a pass just for setting because I, you know, screw setting. I never put it in until later. I just don't worry about it because I know I'm not good at it. But that would be an excellent pass to do is Mm -hmm. just look at the dialogue. I'm going to add that to my own arsenal. See, this is why I do this show. (laughs) Getting better every day. That is so good. And I've never heard anybody say that before. Thank you. Okay, so what thing in your life affects your writing in a surprising way? Travel. Okay, tell me more. Uh, Because... You know how it is. Once you get deeper into this career, you're often going to conferences or festivals or like I also do school visits where I go and talk to children. And I have not been able to crack the code on being super productive when I'm on the road. And that's caused me problems. It's caused me problems, though, because I've missed deadlines. I I mean, I'm not I used to be the guy who's like, I'm never going to miss a deadline. And that quickly changed once I'm on the road 50 days a year or 70 days a year. And. I've not been able to figure that out. And I look at like some of my some of my colleagues like like Jason Reynolds, who 
he says he writes five pages a day no matter what mm -hmm. and like i've literally been at festivals with him and he's like he gets up and he's like i gotta go upstairs and write five pages i have a and girlfriend like, who does that yeah she, yeah, she, yeah, she, yeah, she I, actually I, writes more when she's traveling because she really says she can write more in a hotel room and i feel like I, when i'm in a hotel room my brain shuts off yeah same way like I'm, I'm watching HBO go. Seriously, like, <laughs> I don't have that at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, and I know, I know I need to do better, but I just have not been able to figure that out. And so it's just more like I have to just manage my workload where sometimes I won't go on the road to finish a project mm -hmm. and I'll have to turn certain events down. The other thing that has helped me recently is I finally admitted to myself that I don't until I crack the code, I'm not going to allow myself to think I can. So now yeah. any travel days count as a non-writing day for me. And then exactly. if anything I get done, it's just a bonus. But I really hate it. And if you figure out how to crack that code, please let us know. <laughs> I will pass on the information. <laughs> okay, so what is the best book that you personally read recently, and why did you love it? Um, I would say The Nickel Boys by Ooh. Colson Whitehead. Oh, and I didn't. I haven't heard about this one. It, it's, it, it's, it came out last month, I think, okay. so it's, fair, it's really new. Really new. And I'm going to be honest. I'm not going to say that I necessarily loved it because it's a tough read. It's a really tough read, but it's like important. It's gut wrenching. And I finished it in a hotel room. Mm. And after I finished it, I spent like an hour just pacing the room, like thinking about it. Wow. And what's it, the it, what's the time frame and setting and everything? It, so it, it, it moved from like the around the late 50s, early 60s into the 80s, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, it has to do with uh, a young man who gets incarcerated at a boy's home and when he's young. And it, and it deals with the, what he dealt with at at the school. It's not really a school. It's a, it's a mini prison. Mm -hmm. it, they, they, there's abuse. Mm. It's horrible. And the repercussions in his life as an adult. And, and there's just some really great twists and turns in there along with some of the gut-wrenching things. And it's based on actual history. Uh -huh. um, and so I would, you can't go wrong with a Colson Whitehead novel. Exactly. And, and that one just blew me away i think i think we're going to hear much more about it i mean it feels like one of those books that might win the national book award i love the the image of you pacing the hotel room thinking about it afterwards that's when you know mm. there, there have been a couple of books in my life where i turn the last page and i sit there and stare at the the you know the last page or the blank screen on the kindle and then i flip to the front and i start it again mm. to try to figure out what happened and it sounds like this it might is, be one of those books. this this is definitely one of those i yeah. haven't been able to 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 brace myself to reread it yeah. But I mean, I felt like sort of just hollowed out afterwards. Oh. It, it, it's a powerful, powerful book, particularly when you know something like that probably really happened to somebody. Yes, yes. That's going straight to the top of my TBR pile. Thank you very much. Speaking of TBR piles, tell us about your latest book. Tell us a little bit about it. Tell us where we can find you, all of that. Okay, so my latest book is The Last Last Day of Summer. It that is came out. April. It's a gorgeous looking book too. I don't have it Thank yet, you. but it's so beautiful. It's about Otto and Sheed, who are sort of like the supernatural um, detectives in their southern town. And on the last day of summer, they want more time for adventure, and they get tricked into freezing time with a magic camera. And so they have to figure out how to undo that before everything gets stuck forever. Um, they meet some really fun and funny characters along the way um it was inspired by the phantom toll booth so there's a lot of wordplay in there okay because that was i never asked this question but because i think it's so irritating but i was gonna say where did you get that idea yeah okay. it totally came from the phantom toll booth the way um the way just idioms are used mm -hmm. and so i use a lot of time idioms in the last last day of summer um they become people and they oh, cool. they're very they're very true to their name and it causes a lot of problems for the boys what age group is this for this is a middle grade book so i would say okay. anywhere from 8 to 12 but if um if you're a kid at heart i'd say you can still read it I i'm a kid at heart so what i'm going to do is buy it and then give it to my um 11 year old nephew who is yes. the biggest fan of wordplay as well as is my wife that will all share it so awesome. <laughs> and where can awesome. we and where can we find you um i'm at lamargiles.com that will have links to everything in my social media on twitter i'm at lr giles and on facebook i'm lamar giles writer and instagram i'm just lamar giles it has been such a treat to talk to you thank, thank you. you for everything that you're doing and i cannot wait to go 
purchase that book at my local bookstore where I will order it because I'm trying not to order so much on Amazon. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Well, I certainly hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much, Lamar, and have a wonderful night. Thanks for chatting with us. Uh, same. You have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.